Hello and welcome. I am Gohar Raza and you are watching Eureka. There was a Bhadralok family in West Bengal. Father was a photographer, a passionate photographer who is a renowned person today. Mother was a painter and in this family, who knew at that time that a scientist will be born? A girl scientist who was interested in environment, was very inquisitive and was equally interested in games. Welcome Dr. Chandrima Shaha. Thank you, my pleasure to be here. How did this happen? I am sure a lot of people have asked this question repeatedly that how come in a family of artists a scientist is born? You know, uh, although our fa my family was of artists, we had a, a set of different people visiting us, whether they can be sports persons, they were eminent writers like Buddha Dev Bose, scientists like Satyan Bose, film uh, director like Satyajit Ray. So there was a diverse set of people who were coming to our home. So I was exposed to, uh, you know, very different uh, milieu altogether so that I could, uh, you know, choose my interests from there. And there was no pressure. There was no pressure. My parents did give me the values, but they never said that don't do this or don't do that. And my father encouraged me to do science because he himself was interested in science, even though by profession he was a photographer. And that sort of inculcated the sense of inquiry in me and, you know, going for science and um, doing research. Actually, he told me that you should go for research and that somehow uh, remained with me. You started collecting things and, and generally were inquisitive right from the beginning. Uh, would you recollect some of the memories of the past? Yes. Um, uh, my father once bought me a telescope. You know, I was very much interested in becoming an astronomer because I thought that was a very interesting aspect. Then one day he brought me a microscope. I looked through it to a drop of pond water and that's when I decided, oh, I want to be a biologist because it was an incredible move, And then you moving. wanted to be astrologer. Astronomer. Astronomer. Astronomer okay. was uh, because I was looking through the telescope. But then when I saw what, what is under the microscope, that simply enthralled me. And I decided to become a biologist. And since then, I've been collecting insects, looking at the environment, looking at uh, living beings, organisms. And that was the start of my... And it was a big collection. Normally, parents do not encourage you to do s such things. No, but I But had, in your case, probably yes, the father... I, I had snakes, I had insects, I had all kinds of things. You were not scared of snakes? No, I wasn't. Never? <laughs> wasn't. <laughs> you could catch them? Even uh, today, can you? No, I can't. But I did deal with only non-poisonous snakes, which... Uh, a how did of, you know? That they were a friend not? of mine taught me how to do that. How to distinguish between the poisonous, distinguish snakes poisonous, non -poisonous, non poisonous snakes and non-poisonous snakes. And you kept on observing them and yes. study them yes. uh, even during the school days. Coming back to, to, to your family background, did it help you? The excellence that father was trying to achieve, the excellence that mother was trying to achieve, did it help you in, in pursuing your science? Yes, of course, because science is all about excellence, that you will have to reach that a position of excellence to, to be able to contribute something in science. So their values of having excellence in whatever you do did uh, help me in, in, in my career. Later career, because doing photography at that time was a difficult, difficult thing. Yes. Today anybody can pick up a camera and you can keep on shooting yes. as many photographs as you like. And to give enough thoughts in your, what you are pursuing and uh, sense of inquiry, enough thoughts, rigor was very important for me. Do you remember your uh, school and teachers? Yes, I do. I do, do very well. And uh, in school... Did they uh, encourage you to, to School, I was science? really encouraged to take up, uh, you know, life sciences because I was so interested in... I had a museum of insects. So I was encouraged. The school was very important because the teachers were very encouraging. So that's an age where you really... Things get imprinted in you. Uh, coming to, uh, to, to, to science, science, uh, you are director of a national institute which has 
international reputation. Uh, science at one level is extremely democratic, but at another level it is undemocratic in the sense that it does not follow the hierarchies. Even the youngest person could be right. If the entire world says that earth is flat and one person says no it is round and proves it, then it is undemocratic. But anybody can then check up. How do you think that this encouragement that you got and the democratic environment within the family, in the school and late period, how did it uh, encourage you to do the science? You see, uh, being the director of a national institute, first of all, I have been doing science all along and I had a vision about science. But it's an humbling experience that I'm a director of a national institute and so that I can give uh, reality to my vision of how I wanted science to be done. But as, as you said, that each individual scientist has their own thinking and their own ideas. And you have to nurture them, encourage them. This did help me, uh, you know, I was involved in sports and that was a very nice activity because it gave me an idea of how to operate in a team. And there are defeats and there are wins. So that encouraged me to, that the, in the hindsight when I see it, that was invaluable in, in running an institute. Do you still pursue uh, your games? Well, I am interested in them. I do watch, but I, I do not pursue them right now. I do not have time. You were uh, uh, captain of the volleyball team. No, I was cap vice captain of the cricket team when the early cricket days team. of women's cricket, yes. So, this cricket you are still interested in, but you, you do not play anymore? No, I am interested in many kinds of games, which I think is very good to good thing to do. Do not go anywhere. I have to take a break. We will come back soon. Welcome back to Eureka. Dr. Chandrama Saha, we were discussing a very serious issue of uh, science being egalitarian and democratic at one level and very authoritarian at another level. There are no gurus here, there are no authorities here. If somebody says that this is correct and it is proven, then that is proven. Now, how do you identify the talent who can be nurtured for your institute for uh, a later excellent science? See, most of the scientists who come and join our institute are basically very good scientists. So you have to nurture them by giving them resources, encouragement, and if they need some guidance and in freedom science. and freedom, of course. I mean, at least at our institute, there is an absolute freedom of what you want to do. So, uh, in a way, if you identify an extraordinary talent, then you go a little bit more by encouraging that person to uh, become, say, a leader or even a better scientist than he or she is. But in general, I have encountered people who are basically very good. So, you filter out scientists at the level of research or PhD level and then you nurture them. See, science does not know the boundaries uh, of, of gender boundaries. Science does not know caste boundaries or national boundaries or international boundaries. It is universal. Now, in this kind of atmosphere that we are talking about, uh, does, does these boundaries, social boundaries affect science in India? Um, I would say that gender boundaries are not there, but there are difficulties in genders. Like for example, women have a biological problem that one has to address. But in our country, I am very happy to say that we have many options for women to come up. And one uh, observation that I have made after, uh, in our institutes over the last few years, that students are coming from smaller places. It used to be very elite in the, at one time. Now, students are coming from smaller pla places and that is a great thing for India. Because there will smaller be... Smaller places meaning those... Uh, Non-metros. Uh, which are not metropolitan not, towns. Not metropolitan towns, even from villages. You know, people go through from villages, they are coming, taking the education and eventually coming to us. And I think that this uh, is something that the government should do is to have enough good books in regional languages because it percolates and scientific literacy is very important to have people come in 
have students be interested in science and come in in, in, in these institutes, I think future is very bright if we take the right steps. And Are you talking about scientific literacy in general in the society that will encourage uh, the younger generation to come up? Yes. And, uh, which is scientific temper uh, as per a constitution. Or you are talking about good books in schools. No, I am saying scientific literacy, li literacy should percolate in a society. So that scientifically people are aware, that gives us a lot of advantage. For example, simple advantage of knowing that germs are bad for you, you wash your hands. So that kind of literacy actually improves society and also literacy to, this, to, this, to the growing population, the students, knowing about science in books other than schools as well and media. Through media. If I say that the cognitive gap that is created because of the modern uh, era uh, needs to be filled in by scientific literacy, what we are calling as scientific literacy or as Jawaharlal Nehru called it scientific temper. If we don't fill in, then it will be definitely filled in by myths and superstitions. Yes. That danger is always there. Will you agree with this proposition? I would agree with that and we need to very actively and uh, generate literature or even media coverage should be there about science so that the society gets scientific literacy in the sense that I am meaning that it should be scientifically literate. And there should be support from the sovereign, the common man yes. for doing excellent science within the country. Yeah. Without that probably good science cannot be done. Yes, after all it is from the common man that students are going to come. So and they are going to support. They are going to support. I, I am very optimistic about students coming in uh, from you know, every strata of the society and contributing to the knowledge base that we are generating. Uh, in my opinion, that, that, that brings me to, to the next question very smoothly in fact, that one is social acceptance of science and scientific literacy based on scientific temper in the society. Then comes the primary education and secondary education, which should mold people to science or the younger generations to science. And the next stage would be higher education and then research and then interaction with the international community. Which one do you think is the most important stage in the development of science in a country? I think it's the primary school where students are made aware of science uh, they should be made interested in science and I have been with this Indian Academy of Science Summer Fellows program where we've got, like you get many applications that they do want to do summer studies in renowned institutions like universities or, or national institutes. And that's a very good sign because people want to come and know for a short while that what is science is all about. I think primary school and then the undergraduate level is the most important uh, places where science activity should be encouraged. And you are saying that we are not giving enough emphasis at primary level or you think that it's satisfactory? I would say we have, uh, we have space to improve. Because China took a very strong decision and they are going around implementing policies at the school level. There are television channels, there is sufficient material in Chinese language, there is material for children before they come to the school which molds them to do good science. Do you think that we, we lag behind? I, I, I'm sure we do because um, in primary schools where regional language books are, there are no good books in science. But India has a problem that we have a yes, so large number of languages. Yes. How do you cope up with that? Um, since that is our own problem, we'll have to cope up by creating a, a, a system in which books can be made in regional languages because there are so many languages, yes, of course. It's a difficult thing. For India, their problems are very diverse. But uh, we need to do that because not everybody gets to know. There's no easy route. No to easy route. Coming back to education, at secondary and uh, higher education level, what have been the gaps uh, in India? In mentoring. I think mentoring, good mentoring is essential for, uh, for a scientist to succeed. So uh, 
even even a mediocre student coming to a good institute should succeed if a, if he or she gets a good mentor i think that is where the uh, the success of an institute lies so if you even if you get mediocre students you should be able to mentor them properly for them to get interested and do excellent science every scientist that has appeared on eureka has made this point most of them directly some of them indirectly that mentoring is extremely important getting a teacher who molds you to do good science and achieve excellence is the most important thing i have to take a break don't go anywhere we'll come back welcome back to eureka we were discussing with dr chandrima saha uh, how to uh, mold the younger generation to do excellence work in science now you have said that primary education and secondary education is the most important thing but filtering and nurturing the best of the mind to do good science is also equally important but let me come back to the final stage where science knows no boundaries as we agreed on that uh, of nation nation how important is it to interact with the other scientists in the world the community of scientists in the area in which you are working it is extremely important to not only to interact to generate collaborations when you work because it is in a collaborative project that science succeeds because you are not i mean your own thoughts needs to be criticized you are you need to imbibe others thoughts and it's vice versa so among scientists there should be enormous amount of interactions collaborations and that is how science works these days because it is not like you know when madam kuri used to work by herself its science is now very collaborative a lot of people say that physics had a revolution uh, uh about 200 years ago or some some pay people place it at 400 years ago that kind of copernican revolution has ha- happened recently in biological sciences especially immune systems etc etc those those high cutting edge technology and cutting edge science areas are we well placed to to uh, have interaction with the international community and are we at par with them in this area do we take 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 advantage of this turn that happened in the world in biological sciences i would say we are quite capable nowadays to compete with the with the west as one can see um problems there are problems that are very peculiar to us to our country in which we have to take such as such as for example we have the neglected tropical diseases that nobody will work on other than us so there are areas like that but in general i think we are quite at par with the west in in being able to compete with them but at the same time these interactions that are taking place through bilateral programs are a great advantage not only to us but to them as well see the um, uh, united states of america uh, the the experience has been that they have drawn the best of the mind to to uh, usa and those have contributed to to us science do you s- suggest that maybe if we start interacting more and more and bring people from other countries the best of the mind and train our younger generation through this process will it be uh, a better proposition i would say yes to that because um, but it, it requires huge amount of money huge investments are required but india uh, scientific money uh, i mean science sector money i think it's generous so you think that we should open up we should open up bring, bring scientists from outside yes. also very regularly to train our and encourage the excellence within science you have been working in a very specific area of of immune system of cells Uh, do you think a good future for the country is there in this particular area and it will expand i would say yes because you see m- many of the diseases are due to failure of the immune system and the more we understand about it the more we will uh, be able to will be in a position to treat the diseases so i would say that immunology research is going to expand and there are more and more uh, 
uh, immunologists that are like wanting to come back to India. So I see a bright future for immunology in future. And do you think that a number of institutions should be created in India because there has been a debate on uh, uh, redundancy of, of institutions? India being a poor country cannot invest huge amount of money in creating a large number of institutions. Yet, India would require probably some kind of redundancy. If one institution is not doing good, the other institution should be able to do good. So, do you think that more and more institutions in one specific area should be created in the country? Institutes should be created but with a thought because uh, we don't want to duplicate efforts. We want to uh, reinforce one institute which is already there doing very well to uh, do better. It would be good if many institutes doing similar kind of thing because India is too large. One institute, one national institute of of science in any area cannot handle all the problems that nation is facing. Net networking between institutes should be uh, encouraged. And competition, competition also. And Healthy competition yes. between two yes. institutes. Collaborations, networking and competition, yes. You have gone through all these stages. When your institute was created, uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi dedicated it to the nation. And at that time you were uh, a young scientist in the institute. Today you are heading the institute itself. This journey has been satisfactory in my opinion. Uh, but how do you see this journey as a scientist? I look at this journey with great satisfaction that I have been able to um, contribute to the knowledge uh, of what I set out to do. And But there are there was scope of doing even better. I wouldn't say that I have, you know, there was scope where I would have, uh, could have done better. But that's always a scientist feels that I have not done enough. enough. You think that the younger generations would do better than you have done? Situations are different. The time when I came, the time when I joined, money in science was very less and opportunities were less. But now there is uh, almost the sky is the limit. So when a youngster comes into science now, I'm sure they will perform uh, with much greater speed than we could. Even as a woman scientist where our society does not really support women to do well in science, you have done excellent work. And there has been recognition within the society, within the community of scientists. Now, do you look back and, and say, I've done enough? It has been recognized, now let me relax. Or you would take up a position where you create the same institute from scratch. I wouldn't say, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not like that I'm satisfied that I've done enough. I think I can do more. So, uh, but in what form it is, that will depend on what the future course I will take. Scientists don't retire. No, scientists don't Scientists don't retire, don't retire yeah, till their brain At least never in their thoughts. At least never in their thoughts. The last question, which we have been asking every scientist who has appeared here, a message to the younger generation. I would urge the younger generation to take up science. But when you take up science, you should be really interested in the problem that you're working on. You should be diligent. You should be sincere in addressing your problem. And you will reach where you where you know the ultimate goal of doing the best science and after all uh, doing science and everything you should be a best human being as possible by you so being a good human being is the best thing you can do wherever you are and especially in science your integrity has to be very high you have been interested in games you have been interested in science you have been interested in photography painting so you are a person who is a complete person and not a typical scientist as is projected in the society. So be diligent, pick up a problem, work on it and it will require hard work and if you do that, you can be excellent scientist. That is what is the message Dr. Chandrima is giving to the younger generation. We will come back next week with another fascinating personality, a scientist who has excelled. Till then, 
goodbye. However, may I uh, on your behalf promise the viewers that you would be ready to answer any question, query or uh, clarification yes, if they course. send it to us and we will send it to you. Of course. Write to us at Eureka RSTV at gmail.com. We will come back next week once again.